Well, good afternoon, everybody from Dayton, Ohio. This is Steve Bailey. It's three o'clock my time. I know it's noon for those of you on the West Coast. I want to welcome you to today's webinar um, titled How to Communicate Up. A couple of business items on the front end. We are recording it. And then secondly, a little housekeeping item. The webinars for the rest of the year, February through November, will be held on the third Thursday of the month. <clears throat> That's how we've done them in 2016 and 2017. Of course, there's always an exception to the third Thursday rule, and that was obviously this month, and will happen again in July. Both times our enemy board of directors meetings are that third week, and we can't uh, run a webinar and do a board meeting at the same time. So we ask your indulgence, and please note that the July meeting will be on the fourth Thursday. Everything else, especially for those of you who need to reserve rooms and such, it will be on the third Thursday. So with that in mind, um, let's begin to talk about how to communicate up. I put together some learning objectives for today. I got six of them, and they are how to have meaningful dialogue with the executive management, how to understand the CEO mindset, do some learning about C-speak, I call it, learn how to sell yourself and your vision. Towards the end, we'll talk a little bit about the importance of knowing how to converse socially with senior managers. And then uh, assuming I don't gab too much, I wanna take five minutes at the end and use some of these principles to help you garner support for NMA. So, how do we define executive management? Um, geez, I wish that were as easy as it sounds. Um, the phrases senior management, senior leaders, executive management kind of go back and forth and they can mean different things to different people. If you're in a smaller organization, CEO is in your building, maybe in, and just uh, upstairs and down the hall. If you're in a big corporation, the CEO may be uh, half way across the country or she may be in just in a different facility. Um, so maybe your site has a senior leader. So I'm basically going to address everything today from the corner office and a big company perspective with the caveat that the principles apply pretty much across the board, um, even to just reading. Um, I'll be here, thank you. Trying to mute everybody here. I am uh, muting everyone. Um, we'll unmute everybody later on so that you can ask some questions if you want. But anyway, back to who senior executives are. Also try and remember that whether you're talking to a corporate CEO or just your boss, most times the principles, the hints, the suggestions are pretty much all the same. Um, so that's how we're going to uh, talk today, kind of basically how to interact with anyone above you in the food chain. So how you look at senior leaders uh, is kind of up to you. It can be based on your perspective from experience. It can be based on fear. Uh, it can be based on what you've read about someone. Um, I totally found these graphics on the internet a while ago and thought they were kind of funny. And then I added two of my own, one of my favorite being top right, uh, Faye Dunaway when she was playing Joan Crawford in Mommy Dearest. And this was um, Joan Crawford when she when her husband died and she inherited his seat on the board of PepsiCo and she stepped in to run a meeting. And while in present company, I can't repeat a famous line that she used. Uh, some of you may remember what it was, not to be said in polite company, but she wasn't taking any you know what from anyone. So down at the bottom, we also have Miranda Priestley, uh, played of course by Meryl Streep in Mom, in. Um, the Devil Wears Prada, and she was certainly a diabolical editor and a force to be reckoned with. So, uh, however you view executive management, um, it's important that you learn C-speak. And by C-speak, I mean how to talk to the chairman of the board, the chief executive officer, the chief operating officer. Today, a lot of companies have a chief uh, learning officer, chief information officer, um, a chief technology officer, Recently, I know some companies have someone equivalent to a chief marketing officer, and of course, in today's world, enlightened organizations have a chief diversity officer. So, uh, no matter which one of those you're speaking with, you need to have a plan. Um, I'm not going to say I'm not one to say you shouldn't fear people at this level. Um, but they do deserve some respect and they do care about the future. 
<clears throat> and um, we'll, we'll talk more about their personalities. So, um, moving along, uh, I want to thank somebody by the name of Brendan Reed, who's a business consultant. And I made the mistake on Tuesday, I guess it was. I thought, you know what, I'm going to Google this topic just to see if there's anything out there that catches my eye or something I should uh, maybe read and or share and be darned, of course, after I had the presentation all done, if I didn't end up adding a couple slides here in a second that you'll see, because I found a blog on February 17th, February 2nd from Mr. Reed, and it was called My Best Tips for Talking to Senior Executives. So I thought, well, shoot, I better look at that and see if, uh, if I incorporated everything that he, that he said. So what I'm borrowing from him is best summed up in this graphic, which I put together. This is mine, not his. <coughs> Excuse me, with the question, which one of these are you? So let's absorb those for a second. And Mr. Reed says that in his experience, most of us fall into one of two profiles uh, when it comes to communicating with senior executives. And um, I'm wondering if you can guess what these are. Um, and I realize this meeting with a, a, an executive could be one that you requested, you've asked for time, you've gone in and uh, gotten a meeting set up, or you've been directed to meet with the executive, make a presentation, um, and you're coming in the door that way. But either way, uh, Mr. Reed says that unfortunately, most of us. Uh, fall into two categories. We're either a wet noodle or we are a rigid rigatoni. And his blog, he's, he's, obviously I think he's someone I would like. He was quite funny in, in how he writes. And he said he didn't know what made him talk in terms of pasta that day, but whatever it was, it, to me it worked and it caught on and I'm sharing it with you. And he said most of us are wet noodles because we want to demonstrate respect. And those of us of a certain age group were certainly brought up that way, um, that anyone, Above you in an organization, um, you um, pretty much go in the door respecting them. Um, he said we we worry about our ideas being wrong, so maybe we don't take as firm a stand as we should. We tend to talk around issues. We meander and preface and provide context instead of making decisive points. We sometimes hedge, and we immediately defer to the executive for his or her opinion and. And I thought, I wonder what he means by that. Well, he shared it. He goes, it's not uncommon to hear that, quote, um, I think we should consider stopping this program uh, unless you don't think that's the right thing to do, quote, unquote. Well, I had to laugh because I certainly in my younger days, I, I would have been totally guilty of that. So while we understand why we're wet noodles, um, it usually backfires. And sure, we want to be deferential and no. We don't want to act like we're trying to shove an idea down the boss's throat. But at the end of the day, you've got to be decisive and you need to provide value. And when you talk in circles in front of an executive, you look like you really don't have anything to contribute. Um, and why is that important? Well, our job is to make our boss's job easier, not ask him or her to do all the decision making. So you're supposed to be offering solutions. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. So if you are a rigid rigatoni, um, Mr. Reed said that this is the smaller camp, but it's growing. And uh, I don't want to pigeonhole anybody. I'm not real fond of boxes, but um, I'll share his. He said he sees it more frequently as millennials move into the workplace. And being a rigid rigatoni is obviously the opposite of the wet noodle. And in an attempt to appear competent and confident, um, Sometimes people get way too aggressive in how they present their ideas to senior leaders. And that's a big word of caution. A lot of this stems, I think, from a need to feel respected. Other times it comes from maybe you and I, we've been a wet noodle, and somewhere along the line we decided we really need to change our approach. So we promise ourselves not to be a doormat anymore. Well, nine times out of 10, according to our friend, Mr. Reed, he said this ends badly as well. We are too passionate. We stop thinking creatively, we respond badly to constructive feedback or alternative uh, suggestions. And he said he's seen people try to walk, try to talk with executives as if they're BFFs. And then my favorite line, he said, they try to take it to the friend zone when they weren't invited. 
And gosh, that is that's such a great line. I wish I had thought of it. Because, that, geez, that can really be cringeworthy, if not downright embarrassing. Um, so unless you are close friends with this person, um, don't act like you're long-lost buds. And, and then finally, the impact of being rigid. Well, you can come off cocky or reckless or worse, just disrespectful when you truly don't want to be there. So uh, the last thing from Mr. Reed, and I'll share it. Uh, he goes, if you found yourself getting into heated arguments with your boss, or you've caught yourself trying to fist bump a senior executive, I recommend that you stop. So uh, I thought that was good advice and definitely worth sharing. Um, there's an expression that's pretty common that says, uh, leaders tend to sit at 30,000 feet, especially at the CEO level of most organizations. Their job is to make decisions from across um, the entire organization and from the perspective of the entire business. Um, they have entire functions and business units reporting to them. So it's their job, whether it's your idea or somebody else's, to recognize how everything interacts and comes together and make sure everything happens as it should. They think long-term, short-term, and every term in between. They have to move freely from strategy to tactics. So um, they're going to look at anything you say with that frame from that perspective up there at 30,000 feet. And you gotta remember that before you even get going on it. Um, and then basically, the most important thing that I think you can remember they're busy. They are beyond busy. And let me ask to think about yourself. When you get swamped, when you feel your inbox is growing and your outbox is not, um, think about your own day. How fond of you are interruptions? Do you like drop-ins? Um, do you like people to call, especially if you, have, if you answer your own phone and you don't know they're calling? Um, do you prefer that people get permission? Or I like to send people a text and say, is it okay for me to give you a buzz? Um, to me, it's that old respect thing. So put yourself in the executive shoes. They have more demands on their time than you and I can possibly imagine. And I've told this story before, but several years ago, I was speaking at an LDC and um, talking about the importance of executive interface. And a chapter leader came up to me afterwards and said, um, Steve, I've been, I've been trying to get an hour with our CEO to talk about NMA, and I'm just not having any luck. Do you have any advice for getting my foot in the door? Well, what I wanted to first say was, well, get your foot out of your mouth. And then I wanted to hit him over the head with a rubber mallet. And what I really wanted to say was, are you kidding me? Um, I mean, think about it. If that executive is at his desk or her desk for 10 hours a day, and you ask for an hour, you just ask for 10% of his time. And no offense to anyone, but none of us, myself included, are that important. And the first thing I told him was, I said, look, I said, you need to start by asking for more, no more than 12 to 10, 12 to 15 minutes of the person. And once you get in the foot in, your foot in the door, I said, there's a chance he'll ask you to stay or you'll feel encouraged to hang around a little bit and finish the discussion. But wait to be invited. Don't invite yourself. But if you get in there and when you get in there, there are some strategies to keep in mind. Now, this is one I'm going to phrase about uh, 50 different ways um, while we're in this discussion. The first one is tell them why they are meeting. Now, sure, you've uh, long anticipated and nervously awaited this appointment, but for your executive, this appointment may be simply one in a dreary day of a multitude of meetings and decisions. If you made it well in advance, they may not exactly remember why you're there. Um, and you know, there are a lot of times you're going from meeting to meeting and barely just have time to look down to calendar to see what's next. And if their admin scheduled the meeting, and we'll get to that, the importance of that, if their admin got you on the person's calendar, um, chances are they really are pretty clueless. So um, remember that senior leaders are people first and executive second, and they want to at least look like they know what they're doing. Um, so you got to treat them like you want to be treated. You need to tell them why you are there and why your topic is important to them. Put it another way, talk fast and get to the point in one minute if you can. You know, you got to remember that senior leaders exist in high-pressure environments. 
you know, they got 80 hour weeks, emergencies cropping up, high stress loads. They have demanding bosses and shoulder and shareholders. So time is one of their most precious commodities. They have tight schedules. That means you have very limited time to get their attention. So don't waste time by arriving late or if you're doing a presentation, fumbling with the equipment, you don't have it ready before he or she walks in, um, doing some kind of long rambling introduction. Get to the point as quickly as you can, preferably within the first minute. Is it okay to exchange pleasantries first? Yes, absolutely. That came up in this morning's session. Someone said, well, what, you know, how do you feel about looking around the office, finding something to kind of break the ice with? I said, that's fine and actually preferable. Um, everybody likes that one moment to decompress and to catch your breath. Chances are he or she's running late. Chances are you're nervous. So if you can mention something about, oh, I see your son, uh, understand he just got a scholarship to Purdue or whatever, you know, that um, kind of makes it personal. And then you get going. So these are very bright people who can absorb information quickly or they wouldn't be where they are. So um, they're, they're quick to note issues or omissions. Uh, they won't hesitate to speak their mind and they have limited time to understand. So what do you want to do? You want to start with a headline. Um, they don't want to listen to a monologue. Um, most of us make the mistake of taking too long to make a point. We provide too much context. It's kind of standard nature to work your way up to making the point. I think we all do that, but in, and I do, and in front of an executive, probably not the best move. And I think we do it because maybe we're scared that if we don't, our ideas will get rejected or the executive will think we haven't thought it through or that think we haven't considered all the variables. But at this level, that's kind of flawed logic. The best way to lead is with the headline. For instance, um, sir or madam, my recommendation is that we cancel this program. It's costing us too much money and it's not showing enough growth potential, unquote. There, you've stated why you're there and what you're gonna be talking about. This way you don't force your boss to sit there and listen, waiting for you to get to the point. Um, another way to do it is to think in 30 second in, in, uh, increments. Um, let's face it, you've all been in boring conversations and even 30 seconds is interminable when you're talking to someone you don't particularly want to. It can be forever. Um, I found, in, in putting this together, I found one study that said on the phone, about every seven to 11 seconds, we are considering whether to get off the call or stick around. In face-to-face -face meetings, you get a little more grace period, supposedly all the way to 30 seconds before they decide whether to tune you out or not. So that's just a way of saying if you're not generating someone's interest, you are losing. It. So make sure that you know what your point is in the first place. Um, and that may seem a little strange, but you kind of have to say uh, to yourself, do I have a point? Um, uh, but the truth is, this should be your approach when you're talking in any business conversation, even when you stick your head in someone's office. You know, why are you there? Usually you're asking for action, you're seeking input, you want a decision, or you're looking for support. So you need to know exactly what you want. You need to compel the executive to linger with you by offering a compelling mes message quickly. Um, let's say the exec would only have 60 seconds to spend with you. What would you say? There again, another way of saying the same thing is to say, hey, uh, begin with the end. Let them know exactly why you asked for this meeting and what you want from them. Um, kind of like the subject line in an email. Um, you're hoping that they will open your email. Um, hopefully when they see your name, they don't automatically hit delete. Hopefully they at least wait until they get, someone gets to the subject line. And the subject line should be, uh, like for me, one thing that drives me nuts if there's a chain of emails that started with the topic, but the, the topic morphed, became something else. Well then two days later, someone's still using the same stupid subject line. Uh, they, you need to update it. The same thing with, with dealing with an executive. Uh, be clear, be concise. Um, and part of that is just selling a vision before you get into details. You know, don't walk into a meeting and start talking details. Um, you're in there for some reason. You've got some vision, so paint a picture of it. Um, what is the benefit you're in there to sell? You know, you've walked in with an idea or whatever. You've been asked to do a presentation. Doesn't matter. 
um, there's, there's an end result you're looking for. It's usually a better future. Something is going to be better because of what you are doing or what you are asking or what you are asking for. So executives will ask you for details when they're ready. Or have to say, I'm with you, uh, give someone else um, the details. So it's just part of what I call your big picture strategy. Remember to think from that 30,000 foot, what really is going on here? What are the salient important points? And lastly, one more time, just saying it the, in a different way, summarize up front. Um, I read somewhere that if you've been given 30 minutes to present, which if you, you know, you may get that if you've been asked to do a presentation versus just come in for a meeting. But if you've been given 30 minutes to present, then when you're doing your intro or your headline, pretend that your whole slot of time is just five minutes. And this will force you to lead with only the information your audience really cares about. Those higher level findings, your conclusions, your recommendations, a call to action, whatever it is. State those clearly and succinctly at the start, then move on. And moving on, I've uh, got a key factoid for you. I'll call it Steve's key factoid for today. Executives are experts in finding holes in your logic or content. For some of them, it's a game. That's okay. For others, it's just who they are and how they operate. They want to be sure that you understand the consequences and implications of anything you're asking or talking about. They need to be able to trust your analysis and your recommendations. And my other factoid is, if you can't back it up, don't put it in. Um, I think we've all made that mistake when we've said something and then someone asked us for additional information or how we know it for sure, and suddenly the emperor has no clothes. I've been there. Uh, I can tell you it's not nice to be standing there with no clothes. Um, so anticipate questions, be prepared with additional supporting data. And that's especially important if um, you're, you know, what you're doing <coughs> or presenting can be viewed as counterintuitive or unexpected or challenging for some people. Um, running amok or running opposite current opinion or practices or just result in significant changes. That's when you better have your data, better be good and better be with you. Um, it may be a case of reading the room and knowing that um, your supporting documentation is to be left behind or to be given to someone else. You know, for goodness sakes, don't walk in, throw an 11 by 17 Excel spreadsheet from you know where on the table. Um, that is a sure sign that the executive should probably run out of the room screaming. So you've got to be able to read the room. Okay, once you've made your big point, it is okay to, to offer to walk the executive through the process you use to come to that recommendation. Would you always do that? No. Um, but in most cases, you probably can pull it off because this is how you demonstrate your own objectivity and the quality of your thinking. Um, the exec could be sitting there going to himself or herself, how did you get there? Um, so example, you know, after you give your headline, you can say, and I'd be happy to walk through, walk you through my decision process and the other alternatives I consider. And then you pause. And if he or she indicates, yeah, that would help, fine. If they say no, then, then you move on. But at least you're attempting to engage the executive in a conversation and giving him or her a window into how you think <coughs> and um, basically what? A window into your own value. So once you've done all that, um, it's okay to ask for advice or input to make your project better. Um, I mean, come on. By now, they're probably waiting to jump in if they haven't interrupted you already. Um, boy, I've been there when I have my presentation all set up and someone just jumps in and <coughs> ends it all and basically throws you totally off track. So when that happens, you roll with it if you're prepared. But anyway, um, depending on the situation, you know, go ahead and ask for advice. Um, it's your job to take their advice then constructively and to use it to make your work better. Um, instead of being a wet noodle and saying something dumb like, well, unless you don't think it's a good idea, you know, which just immediately undercuts you, yourself, um, you might say something more like, I'd love to get your perspective and advice and how to make this even better or how I might present this to other people. Again, this is all relative to why you are there in the first place. It doesn't apply always. Um, but I've found over the years that most people in the corner seats 
um, are decent folks and um, they will appreciate you asking for their advice because it really is a nice way of being deferential and getting some information at the same time. Okay, um, watch for signs of boredom. We know what they are. Checking the watch, looking over your shoulder, they start fidgeting with their glasses, um, they, they get glassy eyes. You know, if you're on the phone with somebody, you know, you hear the email launch in the background or you hear someone's phone going off or the, the executive is going, uh-huh, uh-huh. And that's your uh-oh uh -oh moment. So learn how to spot these moments in a group situation and respond to them. Um, piece of advice I got a few years back was to know how to interrupt yourself. And my first question was, what do you mean? And the answer was, well, hey, you know, um, an honest interjection, if you see things might be heading down the boredom path, is to say, well, um, you know, the bottom line here is you kind of stop. You stop yourself from, from saying anything else you shouldn't be saying. And you say, well, the bottom line is, or the key point I want to make is, uh, so this pattern interruption brings a com the conversation back to point <coughs> and gets engagement. Sorry, everybody on the East Coast has something. Luckily for me, it's just been a cold. All right, so what are the, some of the phrases that people in the executive suite like to hear when you're sharing an idea or doing a presentation? Well, they're actually pretty obvious. Nothing no one doesn't know. <coughs> but I know some people are on the phone and, and they can't see the visual. So uh, I'm going to read the bullets, realizing you can read them yourself if you're looking at them. Um, uh, how to improve our customer satisfaction. My idea will increase our market share or decrease our operating expenses or increase our revenue. Um, some of them really like to hear, you know, uh, I think we can beat the competition or shorten our time to market. Maybe it's a different um, avenue where it's, I think we can improve performance and employee performance by doing this and reduce turnover. So need to, need to look at the features of whatever you're presenting and figure out what the benefits are. Um, the one valuable sales course I ever had in my life, and it wasn't until after I'd been with NMA for a long time, and we were doing some training with our field staff, ladies spent the better part of a day trying to teach us the difference between features of something and benefits. Trust me, you can Google it if that is of interest to you, do, and learn the difference. It makes all the difference in the world when you're trying to get, um, a sale across, and that can be something as simple as the sale of an idea. Okay, so, however, beware of details. Um, you know, there, there probably are two types of execs, those who have no interest in details, and those who have far too much interest in details. Um, the first, and we've seen them both. I have, I know you have. The first type is easily bored. If you give them too much detail, you're gonna lose their interest in town. And, because they, they the expression is they can't be bothered. The second one is easily sidetracked. He or she may take notice of something small and become engaged and the next thing you know, he or she has taken your presentation, your conversation down into the weeds and you really don't wanna get there. So um, keep your presentations, especially your visuals, spare and simple. And we'll talk more about that one more time before we close. Um, note one thing. You got to put your own graphic in here, but uh, I ran across the expression that says strip tease holds attention better than full disclosure. And at the risk of that being incorrect, let me see if I can save myself here and say that nothing makes an executive feel more powerful than discovery. So sometimes, you know, people like to feel clever, if not brilliant, and there's no thrill in witnessing an information dump. There really isn't. So sometimes when you reveal only a little at first and let your executive feel powerful by asking questions and then treating the responses as discoveries, that's good. And, you know, the, the, there's three words that I think are just wonderful if they come from your presenter, and that's if she or he says, tell me more. That's when you know that the strip tease has worked, that, you've, that you're layering your presentation, and that you are opening yourself up <clears throat> from, for more input, usually pretty good input. So what else? <clears throat> okay, now we're gonna go through a few slides of just kind of nuts and bolts and little bullets. The first is to remember that everybody, everybody, whether you're at the executive level or not, 
has a radio station pretty much playing in their head 24 seven. And it's tuned in to station WIIFM, the what's in it for me station. Um, so the executive is asking himself or herself, well, okay, why am I spending time with this person? What's in this for me? Uh, hopefully five minutes into your presentation, they're no longer asking that. Uh, but you got to remember that all along, they, that's where they're tuned in. It's important to lose your ego, but keep your self-confidence. What I mean by that is ego, ego isn't helpful, but self-assurance is a must. Be organized, be fresh, uh, be um, professional, you know, don't freeze up uh, or feel intimidated. Uh, let your personality shine through. Um, most people in the executive level are human beings and they're okay with that. They're used to being played many times. So if, you know, assuming your personality is charming, uh, then you need to let people see that and just be yourself. The executive will respect that. Now, you know, back to what we said earlier, you don't want to get too, too chummy, uh, but attend to the small things. Um, um, don't expect, for instance, if you bring a pro, if you bring a problem to the executive, that you're that they then own it. No, you just brought it to them, hopefully with a solution. Um, so that's why you're there is to make t their life easier. And um, the other thing, it's not on here, but it's in my notes under small things. For heaven's sakes, watch the clock. Um, you know, because if you're not, trust me, the executive is. And it is so easy to lose control and realize, oh, yikes, I've been in there far longer than I should have been. So do not wrong, run long and make sure you thank them at both the beginning and the end. Um, to me, this is one of the best slides, enlist the help of others. Um, the higher up they are, the chances are they may have an administrative assistant. Well, this man or woman needs to become your BFF. Um, reserve, you know, ask them to reserve time on the executive schedule. Um, make sure that uh, they get the correct date and time and the space. Follow up with the admin the day before. Um, word of caution, be ready for a cancellation and have a plan in your head to reschedule if you need to. Um, people at that level um, have unexpected, important demands on their time and um, don't take it personally, but you probably aren't at the top of their list that day. If something a business imperative comes up to which they need to attend, uh, you're going to be asked to reschedule. So what? Big deal. Just gives you more time to be prepared. Um, if you can practice your approach with an audience, that's a good move. Um, if you're doing a presentation, um, please take my advice, and that is walk through it on your own, talking out loud. It makes such a difference when you hear your own voice and it makes you go through and, and highlight text, highlight things in your notes that you want to be able to look down and grab because they're highlighted or underlined and you're not totally always reading from the script. Um, back to uh, and the title here, Enlisting the Help of Others. <clears throat> if there's no admin, then find someone who's um, good friends with the person with whom you want to meet. Um, ask, what are his or her picadillos? What are, what, what are their likes and dislikes? Um, I remember reading that there was one company where a CEO hated it when people walked in and got overly political correct and said, well, you know, we're facing some challenges and we have some issues. And he was famous for railing, damn it, we have a problem. If we have a problem, quit walking away from it. Acknowledge it, then we can deal with it. So that's kind of important to know. Um, before you go into that particular executive with a problem that you want to solve. So um, there's always an insider. Maybe that should have been uh, the title of this slide. Know the insiders and find out what they know um, and ask them. They always will. Okay. Um, if you are asked to make a presentation, uh, PowerPoint or otherwise, okay. Um, don't make it any longer than need be, but if you weren't asked and you decide you're going to, um, I would check with the insiders to make sure it's okay. And then if you do, use it sparingly. Um, every executive has had a near-death experience with PowerPoint presentations. Uh, and all the people that do all the things wrong, you know, 
too many words on the screen, boring slides, stuff you can't see. Um, this is this is the technolo a technological way to shoot yourself in the foot. So make sure you are not relying on a presentation to make your uh, points. Uh, it should always be uh, an add-on, so to speak. Okay, some more tips. Um, use the right approach. Um, if your executive has some pet initiatives, um, tie yours in if you can. If there's uh, something new that's been announced at the organization that's changing things, well, whatever you're doing, see if it fits in with the new approach or the new buyers or the, the new uh, construction that's going on or the new product you're going to unveil. Uh, and then know your stuff. Um, have an action plan. Be ready for the Q&A. And then, as I said, rehearse. Um, executives know that most people that ask for their time want something. Um, many times they're just sitting there trying to figure out um, how you're trying to play them. So um, be, be smart. Um, have some emotional intelligence. Uh, be upfront and be honest. Be yourself. That will go a long way. Um, and don't try to do too much in one meeting. Um, easy to do. Um, you know, don't try to drop your ideas on them and close the whole thing in 10 minutes. Maybe this is a meeting where, and I had one of these last June, I was meeting with a senior executive, and um, where we went was, I, I had brains enough, luckily, to ask in the middle of it, where I kind of saw where things were going, I said, um, is there anyone to whom you can delegate this and with whom I can work after today to try and make this happen? Um, I immediately saw a light go off and, and she relaxed a little bit and she goes, yeah, as a matter of fact, there is. And uh, I will ask thus and such and such and such. And then she goes, I'll stay on top of it to make sure that it happens, but go to thus and such um, and we'll do the details. So um, th that was good because you know what? She didn't need anything else on her plate courtesy of me. Um, so try and, and work your meetings that way. Uh, Always, in addition to being upfront, act with integrity. Um, you know that, I'm, I'm speaking to the choir, but you still gotta say it in a presentation like this. Um, be honest about what you know and you don't know. Uh, if you've got one of those execs who's trying to trick you, don't let it happen. Just basically say, you know, that's a really good question. I'll get back with you, because I really, I, I don't have the facts and figures you need, but I'll see to it that you get them by the end of the day, or it's already the end of the day, by tomorrow. So, what I want to do at this point is I'm going to unmute everybody. We'll take a little bit of a break. And so we will ask a couple questions out to the group. Um, that is, um, what else have you found that executives like to talk about and or are there some tricks for engaging senior leaders in dialogue that I've not hit that some of the rest of you might like to share? So, anybody want to speak into a microphone? Don't be shy. Anybody at Harbor? <laughs> Somebody's calling out on the phone. You might want to mute that. Let's try Port of Seattle. Anyone there? Definitely getting some feedback. Hammer. How about anybody at Hammer? Let's go here, wait, I can just un- Aha, uh -huh. someone's close to the mic. I hear a gentleman. Ask me something. <laughs> okay. If there are no questions, we'll go on, but I really wanna give you a chance to chime in. We're muted. I've got everybody unmuted. Oh, okay. Except Port of Seattle, I just unmuted you. You were muted. Yes, Steve, this is Scott. Okay, hi, Scott. Hey. Um, I, I, first of all, I think you've hit on a lot of good things. Um, as you know, I... Uh, was both a senior leader and worked with senior leaders in my military background in the Air Force. And um, it, it, it really does help um, uh, make a day more efficient. 
uh, when people think before they <laughs> show up and knock. Um, and um, I guess one little trick that I used to use when I was going to more senior folks was uh, to put together a one page, uh, just a quick bullet agenda, uh, make a couple of copies of it, you know, one for the senior leader and one for yourself. And, um, and that way the, the individual's got a, a kind of a visual that you, first of all, that you do have a point uh, that you're getting to. And you can kind of see as you go through uh, your speaking, uh, you know, how we're, they're progressing through the meeting. Um, I think the other point that you made that's really good is, of course, the use of time. And there's a tendency to call in to the admin or the insider and, and just say, I need an hour. Um, executives actually typically will schedule in 15 minute increment increments. So um, in a lot of cases, you could just ask to schedule 15 minutes or ask to schedule 30 minutes. Um, and, and that's appropriate uh, rather than going straight for the hour. Um, beyond that, again, both when I was in the receiving mode uh, and, and also in the, uh, in the giving mode uh, for briefings, I think uh, what it comes down to is, um, being relaxed and confident, but very respectful, uh, be very attentive, listen to what the senior executive is saying, because uh, sometimes you get so nervous that, uh, that you miss what the kind of feedback they're giving you. And then, you know, at the end of the talk, uh, usually it's going to be something fairly simple. Either he affirms your, um, your analysis or wants you to go do something else. I always like to echo it back and do a summary at the end with the, with the executive. Um, you know, what, uh, here's what we, I understand we talked about. Here's the things that you've asked me to do. And this is what I'm going to follow up on. Uh, and one more thing, <laughs> uh, since I do this frequently now, even in my current job, uh, follow up with some sort of, a, I, I didn't hear what you said, but some sort of a thank you email. And in that thank you email, you can not only thank them for their time, uh, but also uh, uh, re- um, uh, resummarize those things that you're going to be working on saying, you know, I appreciated meeting with you uh, and I will follow up with you on X, Y, and Z. Uh, and in some cases when you do that, they're so appreciative, uh, you know, that they just got a thank you email uh, that they will uh, give you even more information uh, in a return email. So uh, that's turned out to work well for me, but I'll stop there again. Good presentation. Uh, thank you, Steve. Well, I think I'll have you do, um, the second round of this. <laughs> you can do the next one. Uh, that was great stuff. And uh, I, put, I actually wrote down the four bullet points that I thought were most important. One of which I didn't think of was that is to do, do an agenda and share it. Um, not only does it let them know why you're there, it, it lets them know how far along you are. You know, um, and some of you may go, what, what does that mean? Well, the executive you don't know but what he or she has something really 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 pressing and concerning after you um if someone's typing if you could hang on for just a second while everybody's unmuted thank you um while you know that executive will know when you're nearing the end um and that uh, that's just being respectful it's kind of like when i do a in front of a, uh, if I'm doing something in front of a microphone to an audience, I usually take my watch off and lay it there. A, so it reminds me. And then B, the audience knows that, oh, he's not going to keep us past the allotted time. Uh, well, absolutely. And just to, just to piggyback on that real quickly, Steve, um, what, what, what can really get you points is if you get with the insider before you go into the meeting, find out what the executive's next meeting is, and actually manage the time for the executive so that at some point in the conversation you say, sir or ma'am, it uh, looks like you've got 10 minutes before you need to be at that meeting down the hall. Uh, do you want to keep talking or should we schedule another meeting? You know, that type of thing uh, and, and you know, help, the, uh, help the insider or help the admin secretary to keep the individual on time. That's, that's an excellent point. And later on, one of the things I was going to say was, when, if you're watching time, you can always say, well, I want to be respectful of your time. If you'd like me to summarize, that gives them the option of saying, well, no, we're okay. And then you can continue the dialogue or you can get the signal that they're done or it's time to wrap up. But I really like um, knowing what's coming next. That's smart. And, um, you know, you're, the other point you made was the 15 to 30 minutes, always ask for that um, and um, do that through the admin. Check for understanding. Um, you, you know, some, we'll try and do that today here. Summarize uh, the salient points um, that you've gone over. And then uh, I can't overemphasize Scott's right on the importance of a follow-up. 
with a thank you and uh, possibly do the check for understanding there. So thank you. Anybody else before we move on? That was very valuable, Scott. Okay, I'm gonna mute everybody. Do I wanna do it? Yes, so you're all muted. All right, so uh, moving along and I'm gonna to have to talk quickly as I'm looking at the clock here. Okay, um, it's important to, if you get asked the question, answer the question. Um, I was reading an article, it's probably been six, seven months ago, where this, the, someone was saying that he was amazed um, to sit in meetings and watch people hem, haw, dodge, extempor uh, extemporize, and just to do about anything, but answer questions from senior leadership. Well, that just sends them into orbit. So um, if you're asked a question, answer it and be prepared. So I found some samples. Uh, I'm not sure they're the best in the West, but I did not make these up. I found them in, in an article. Uh, one was, on a scale of one to 10, how's the team doing? Well, an example of a bad answer would be, well, you know, the, the guys have been trying hard, things haven't been perfect, but uh, the team's really been pulling together lately, and I think things are improving. Uh, we filled the open head count, and we're making real progress. Well, the author says for that question, what the executive is hearing is blah, blah, blah. This fool is not answering my question, blah, blah. So he suggests a good answer is to say, on a scale of one to 10, seven. Or maybe a better answer is seven, that there are one or two key problems to work out. And the key to that one, as I look at it, is you've answered the question. You just ask the simple one on a scale of one to 10. So you say seven, and there are one or two key problems to work out. You then, you then give her or him the opportunity to say, well, what are those two problems? It may be that the answer seven is they're, they're okay with that and figure everything else is under control. So you're kind of throwing the control lever back in his or her hand. Another question, is the project tracking the finish on time? Well, bad answer is, well, ma'am, you know, you can never be sure about these things. <laughs> it's going pretty well in the long run. Um, the head project manager has had a cold, or with this, I need to upgrade this. The head project manager has had the flu, and we got behind on a few tasks, and gosh, you never know if an act of God is going to interrupt things. And, and the long pole in the tent is getting some new servers delivered, and risk, well, yeah, there's always risk in managing this project. I would hope none of us are this out to lunch that we would give that answer. So the author said a good answer is, yes, but one item on the critical path, server delivery, is holding us up, but not so much that I think we'll miss the deadline. And this guy said the best answer was to say, uh, yes, mostly. Now, to me, that raises questions. I think I would switch. I think the good answer is the best answer. Although, yes, mostly, uh, there again, he just ask a simple question. It was a yes or no question. So if you say yes, mostly, then he or she has the option. I think maybe I get it now of saying, well, tell me more. Uh, what do you mean by mostly? So you, you just got to pay attention to what you're doing. Some more advice for C-levels. Uh, don't ask them to take a leap of faith. Um, make sure you've got the documentation. Um, they'd rather know what they're doing and what the expected results might be. Make sure you focus on the big picture. You're giving examples, give concrete ones. Don't drown in process. God, we're so all prone to do that. And so many people in the executive suite, they've got slews of people that are gonna figure out how. Um, that's down the road for them. They don't particularly wanna know your process. If you've got it figured out, which I hope you do, fine. But otherwise, don't go there. Um, say what your idea will and will not do. Uh, and I think that's basically a good way to, to indicate maybe that you're not blowing, blues, blowing smoke. Um, and then I love this one. I stole this from a presentation I did years ago. I stumbled on it the other day. Approach executives with a plan, not just a pitch. You know, it is so easy to mix the two or um, equate the two. They are not the same. Um, the plan will get a better response than a pitch. Because if, if the pitch works, they're gonna say, so what's your plan? Either way, you gotta be prepared for the cost questions. Uh, if you've got case studies that make sense, use them. Anticipate being cut short. I was a young man with NMA. I was still in the field, trying to start a chapter at American La France. They make fire engines. And nobody had told me yet how to do a presentation, so I was doing my best to tell them everything I knew about NMA. And the CEO stopped me dead in my tracks and says, uh, Mr. Bailey, um, 
can you kind of cut through it and just let me know what is this going to set me back? What do you want from me? What's it going to cost me? Well, that wasn't how I had this thing mapped out. Uh, I was 29 years old and I didn't have a lot of experience under my belt. Um, I must, I survived, I didn't get thrown out of the room, but um, uh, I hadn't anticipated that. So you got to be ready for that one. Make sure then that your CIO or the MIS manager, um, you've got connections because you may need to get process questions. You may need to get some questions answered right after you leave this meeting. So it's a little bit late by then to start making friends with the MIS department. So keep focused on strategic topics and making improvements. Um, be emotionally ready to modify your idea. What does that mean? It just means that the CEO is used to analyzing things. And he or she's going to be looking at from their perspective, not yours. So chances are they're going to see something that you don't. Fine. Um, chances are it'll be better. Don't let the hair in the back of your head stand up. Don't get defensive. Don't get argumentative. Also, don't expect to control the conversation. They didn't get where they are by being quiet and meek. Chances are at some point in time they may wrestle this thing away from you. So, okay. Um, if they're interested, they're start, they, they will start to drill for details, and that's what you want. Um, if you've got stories, for heaven's sakes, get permission. Um, you know, nobody wants to trap for heaven knows how long by you telling some story. However, you know, if you can say, hey, I've got a quick 90-second true story that highlights my point. Is it okay? Then you, there again, you're shifting control back to the executive. He or she can say, sure, go ahead, or no, uh, you know, I'll get that from you later. So then it's like, know when to stop. If you've made your point, don't keep going over it. We've all done that, I still do it. Um, try to be better at it all the time. You have to know when you're done, you're done. Um, it can get worse if you keep going. So you gotta have a certain amount of psychic ability. You gotta be able to read these people. Um, that comes with a little practice and from doing your homework. Um, um, and then if, if the rest of these are, if the CEO says your idea or your presentation or your suggestion is possible, then it is up to you. He or she does not own it. You have not, as I said earlier, you have not just gone into the CEO's office and given them something else to do. They don't want it. They don't need it. So if you get a nod, uh, first of all, you know, silently get on your knees and be thankful for it, but make it happen. Attend to details. Know what your next steps are going to be, um, own those next steps, and own the outcome. So um, one last little thing here, understand the best communication methods for different individuals. This is where the admin, this is where your insiders can tell you how does he or she like to receive information. Do they like charts and graphs? Some people are data-driven. Um, others want uh, the anecdote. Um, others want, like in Scott's case, um, you know, um, an agenda is a good idea, um, and, and then take that further. Do they want other things spelled out? Do they want a written executive summary? Know how this person thinks and acts. Um, kind of like email, if you're emailing with senior leaders, front load it, um, use, uh, be concise, but be layered. Um, this was a lesson learned late for me. Uh, there's plenty of people in the audience who, and will not necessarily joke, but who will tell you about long emails from Steve. Well, I finally figured out that A, the subject line matters, if you want to open it at all, and then B, make your point in the first sentence or two, and let the rest of it be supporting documentation. If people want to continue to read, they will. If not, you've gotten your point across. Um, so we don't have time for group discussion, but if some of you are staying in a room uh, afterwards, this is a good one. You know, what are your lessons learned and best practices when it comes to getting their attention? Um, one last thing, I, I touched on it early, learn to network and converse socially. Um, the ability to interact socially with senior leaders is so darn important. They deal with business all day long. So if you're going to an affair, if you're going to a function and the CEO, senior leader is there, don't be one of those people that the CEO looks up and sees you coming and just wants to run out of the room screaming because they know you're going to hog their time. They know you're going to talk about business and chances are they don't. They've been up to their necks in it. At the end of a 12 hour day, if there's a social function, a chapter meeting, chances are they just want to let their hair down a little bit too. Um, so you got to remember that. Um, mingle and, you know, don't stick with someone so long. Um, when I was in college and we were in the fraternity and we had rush, I remember, 
some guys were really slick at passing somebody off to someone else that they didn't want to talk to. You know, executives can kind of do that too. So, uh, you know, make them, make them smile when they see you coming, not secretly dread visiting with you. Um, if you want to talk to your execs about NMA, we are um, coming down in our last five minutes here, but I think we can go through it. Uh, why would you be in there talking with them? Well, probably some reasons for meeting with executive management would be to present a yearly review of the chapter successes, to plan a top management senior executive night or event, to enlist more support for the chapter. Um, another reason may be to ask for their help in identifying an executive advisor. If he or she isn't the one that's doing it, um, maybe they can suggest someone. Um, a lot of chapters and company organizations have been very fortunate that the senior leaders uh, make NMA events part of their regularly scheduled leadership meetings or all hands meetings, they're often called. It's okay to ask for that. Sometimes they've never thought of it until you ask. Um, another reason to talk with your execs is to encourage them to be executive hosts at meetings. Um, be greeters at the door. Um, maybe do a spotlight presentation for five minutes on something new. Uh, that he or she may be championing. And then what I call the Don Hart question, because he asked this years ago and it's my favorite one, don't be afraid to ask an executive, what can we, meaning NMA, what can the chapter take off your plate? The number one response you get from that is usually, oh, gee, I don't know, no one's ever asked me that before. So that is a good way to get in there. And you, you're, you're using the WIFM perspective there too. Um, they need to know what NMA is doing for them, especially in this day and age when people are moving around from company to company. And, you know, people used to grow up in one organization. They, they belong to your chapter. Maybe they were an officer. And then they moved on to senior management. But, and so they're very familiar. These days, yeah, not so much. So you got to have somebody new come in from another company, let alone another division. So they don't know who you are. So you need to have an elevator speech. And you need to have and be able to rattle off five key reasons why your chapter is a force for good. Now, I call this the CEO scorecard. This is, <clears throat> whether he or she has it officially, they've got it in their head. Does this chapter perform? What is its value? Are learning and employee growth evident here? Do I see that it fosters employee engagement? Is the company mission? advanced because of this chapter? Do they look and act professional when they have their meetings? Do their executive advisors play an active role? Is the company's community image enhanced? You're out there doing a project with your chapter logo on it. Uh, does the executive feel that the company's getting the credit? Can you document return on investment in the, you know, the number of hours of training you're provided or service hours in the community? Um, what percentage of employees are members? Perfectly legitimate question. The CEO doesn't know. He or she has no clue, probably, how many people of all the ones who work there belong to your organization. The question is, do you? So these are the things that you need to be able to, to uh, handle. So you need to set yourself up for endorsement. And that is tie the chapter into the organization's mission statement and anything that's out there about the company's goals and objectives. Figure out a way to stay on their radar screen all year long. Um, make sure that they get updates. Make sure that they see your chapter newsletter. Make sure that um, they get the flyers on the monthly meetings. They may not be able to attend, but you got to stay on their radar. Um, ask your executive advisor to be your chief advocate. Make sure that he or she can communicate on it. Make sure that the chapter is relevant. You know, if you're having someone talking about um, a topic in the community, and it's been a big issue at work, find a speaker, cancel next month, um, get that person another time, find somebody that can address what's going on, be relevant and be timely, and seek ways to integrate senior level people into things. So, as we summarize, uh, let's review the key points. Dealing with exec, you need to start strong, use your time effectively, be flexible when you're presenting, have your supporting data at your fingertips or there. Know your audience. Keep it simple. Once again, be prepared. And those are pretty much my, I'm going faster than I'm turning the page, so I was done. I thought I have one more slide. Sorry, so uh, important to remember here, 
um, the webinar schedule. Uh, we will be doing them the third Thursday of the month. Uh, one exception will be in July. So that gets us to my final slide, which is, are there any questions? I think I have everybody unmuted, and we've got a couple minutes happy to entertain either questions or comments, or like Scott, some other great suggestions that you can share with the group, things that I didn't think of. Anyone? We'll see if I'll get started again. Um, <laughs> I hope other people chime in. But uh, I, I was just thinking, uh, you know, sum it all up. First of all, uh, Steve presented a lot of great information, uh, and I, but I would not let that all scare you away. Uh, you know, it sounds like uh, you know, it sounds like there's some uh, level of master's degree in order to go in and talk. Uh, but what Steve actually did is he gave you all the points of um, a perfect, you know, approach. Um, I think the important thing. Uh, it's, it's what I call my three B's, and that's to be respectful, be brief, and be gone. Um, and <laughs> if, if you can stick with that, uh, you'll find, I, I think you'll usually be surprised at how pleasant the interaction will actually be, uh, and you'll go away feeling inspired and, and more connected with the organization. Uh, so I highly recommend it. Um, uh, you know, I, I actually get paid to, to do that these days with my current job, so I'm happy to talk to anybody that has any particular detailed questions about uh, approaching senior executives. Uh, the other thing I would say is, as, as Steve went through the last 10 minutes or so, uh, he did hit on one of my pet things, and that's answering the question. Um, and I've seen that so many times, uh, and it is, it's very frustrating when it's done wrong. Uh, but the emphasis is answer the question first, and then if you've got more commentary, tack that on to the end. Same thing is true in email communications. I don't know how many times I've seen emails where a very simple question is asked and the answer is three pages long. Um, you know, the three pages of background is okay as long as you answer it up front. You know, say yes, and then give the background into it. Um, executives know the difference between open-ended questions and closed-ended questions. And when they ask a closed-ended question, let's just say yes or no, true or false, that's kind of the answer they expect because they're trying to move on to the next thing. They, they know that you may just say yes and it may leave some other things lingering, but they're okay with that if that's the way they're answering the or asking the question. On the other hand, if they ask an open-ended question, you know, describe to me your program, well, they expect a little bit longer response. So just keep that in mind when you're hearing the question. Again, answer the question first, and then go on into your background after that, again, both in oral and written communications. But thanks again, Steve, great presentation. Thank you. Um, I wanna do one of these with you soon, so we'll do one together. And <laughs> so thanks, Scott. All right, anybody else? Everybody seems to still be hanging on, I'm impressed. Anybody wanna share something? No, just Steve, the Port of Seattle here, just wanted to say thanks. Hello, Port of Seattle, Seattle. what's up? Not a lot, just uh, we enjoyed the presentation. We're getting ready to sign off. Okay, well, thank you for joining today. I appreciate it. Um, looking forward to the next time I get to come to Seattle. You are in a beautiful location. All right, well, make sure you say hi when you come by. Okay. All right. uh, and we do, we do hi, have Steve. some. This is, yeah, this go is ahead. Sharon in Huntsville. Yeah, hi, Sharon. And hi, um, I wanted to share, you know, there's, there's a couple things that really stood out to me and in my experience in presenting to executives um, you know you mentioned keep your slides brief you know, don't put every piece of data on the slide because you can know that data or have it in your backups but they don't want to see that data they just want the clear this is what this is what you want out of us this is what you're trying to sell us the other thing that really stood out to me and I found this to be very true and you end up with a lot more respect um, from your leadership when you anticipate questions before you go in there and you have the answers ready before you go in there, sooner or later, they're just going to quit asking you questions and assume that you know what you're talking about. Oh, good one. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've, I've experienced that from, from going to not having an idea and having to go find the answer to having the answer before I even came in the room. Uh, that, that, man, that is uh, just an excellent point. Thanks, Sharon. Uh-huh. Thank you, Steve. And then there's, there's you know, my, uh, my mother's advice to me when I left home for my first job that you can use, uh, there's two pieces. One, if you don't know anything, dress up. And two was fake it till you make it. 
Uh, I think I like the first one more um, because if you're faking it, you usually get caught. So I think you take Sharon's advice there. It's gonna hurt to dress up. Yeah, and if you don't know the answer, just say, that's a great question, let me find that out for you. You bet, you bet. All right, anyone else? Well, this has been a fun hour. I appreciate everybody hanging in there. Um, uh, I haven't done one of these in a while. I forgot how much I enjoy doing it. Probably, I enjoy this topic because I think it's important and it's easy for me to talk to. Others uh, are a little more challenging. So you've been a great audience. I, the input's been great. I appreciate it. And since it is Thursday afternoon, uh, some of you work 980s and have tomorrow off. But whether you're working tomorrow or not, uh, please allow me to wish you a great weekend. And next month, we have Mike Logan from Boeing in Huntsville. That's in Sharon's organization, by the way. And he's going to be um, um, sharing uh, um, influential leadership. Uh, it's a topic he's very familiar with. He's a good presenter from everything I've heard. And I've certainly been fun to communicate with one-on-one, -on -one, getting to know one another. And I know that February will be a good time. So uh, we look forward to seeing you in February. Thank you again. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.